the um, the Powell Avenue steam plant or the former Powell Avenue steam plant that's undergoing renovations is off to the side over here. And then over here is the 14th Street side. And then down here on the other side of First Avenue South, which is this road here, uh, this is where uh, Regent's Field is located. And of course the railroad tracks themselves are up here. So that gives you a little bit of a, a feel for, for the park. And then just to go over some of the areas in the park that I will be talking about, um, right here is the large amphitheater uh, lawn. If you've been to some of the concerts at the park, this is quite often where they uh, hold those and people sit on the lawn here. And then opposite that, there is a little bit of a wetland area and it flows uh, from there, the water flow into the park comes into this small lake by the rain curtain, uh, which is a, a man-made waterfall, of course, uh, that is here. And then from there, the water just flows uh, into this lake here, what I call the pavilion pool. And then from the pavilion pool, the water flows down uh, this little waterway, which amazingly attracts a lot of birds. And it winds up at this little pond at the end, uh, at the 14th Street end. And then from there, the water is piped back up to the wetland. So most of the water in the park is recirculated, but as they need to, they can draw it down, pump it out, or they can uh, replenish it uh, from, I think, from wells. But the design of the park is such that the water uh, way is meant to just be a, essentially a self-enclosed. And of course, the wetland serves as a filtration area before it flows into the rest of the park. So we've got two fairly large bodies of water. And then the rest of this area here is green space. It's essentially just one giant lawn from one end to the other. And then up on the uphill side, uh, there are a couple of different uh, tree areas that are planted and a lot of uh, different species of native grasses. And most of the plants in the park are native. And so there are, uh, trees up here, and then there's a lot of trees that are planted along uh, the waterway here. Uh, mainly, some of, and some of the ones you'll see in my photographs are things like wax myrtles and river birch uh, trees and tulip poplars. Um, and then other plants that are featured in the photographs are some of the uh, black-eyed, not the black-eyed Susan, the giant cone flowers, which is Rudbeckia. Uh, maxima. And so those are planted in various places in the park. So I'll just um, do a little bit of, of a summary here. So the park opened in the fall of 2010. You'll remember from that previous photograph that they were working on it in 2008. So there's approximately 900 acres of green space, 30% of which is water by surface. And there are at least 600 uh, trees planted in the park and many, many different species of mostly native plants. Uh, the Chinese pistache trees, uh, which are nice and hardy for drought purposes, are not necessarily native, uh, but they do add a wonderful splash of fall color. Um, and then I was just uh, mentioning earlier to Kathy that uh, yesterday a friend of mine uh, sent me a message that he had seen a hermit thrush at the park. And I said, oh, you need to report that to eBird because that is a new species for the park. So uh, for those of you that may know, eBird is essentially like a citizen science project that is operated by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And so people are able to keep, you know, life lists, trip lists, they just report all their bird sightings to eBird. Uh, and so it's, it so happens that Railroad Park is one of the hotspots that's listed for Jefferson County. And it's just eberg.org if you wanna go uh, look yourself. But um, so yesterday uh, it had been at 98 species for a couple of months. And so yesterday we added our 99 species to eberg. But I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about things, other things at the park. So there's a little bit of something there for everyone. Here's some, some men who are enjoying a, 
uh, a game uh, out on the lawn. There's always people. That's what I love about this park. There are always people there enjoying the park, regardless of just about any hour that the park is open, there's going to be somebody there. So here is the big blue guy. Uh, the, one of the Vulcan uh, statues has been there for a couple of years now. Um, but it's a place for people to just enjoy their time together, to get out with their skateboard. Here's a, a little boy rolling on the lawn. Uh, on the hill at the amphitheater with his dog. And we've got a, a lady with her two daughters um, was rolling through the park on their bike and on their scooter. And then even if the hipsters seem to enjoy this, so here we've got a little bit of a mixture of a man with his skateboard <laughs> reading a book. I didn't get a chance to find out what his book was, but I thought it was an interesting photograph, so I snapped it. But as I mentioned today, I want to talk about the birds of Railroad Park. So I have this particular photograph of a yellow warbler, which I did photograph this particular bird um, in the park uh, just this past spring. Uh, but I wanted to start with this photograph because the very first bird I saw when I went to the park, uh, when it about three weeks after it opened uh, in the fall of 2010, I walked across the plaza area by the pavilion, uh, right there by the amphitheater, and I made my way over to the wetland. And I thought for sure the very first bird I would see would be something like a pigeon or maybe a morning dove or a starling or something. But no, as it turned out, the very first bird I saw was a yellow warbler. Yeah. So obviously not this particular one, but there was no mistaking that bird. And when I saw it, it was in a birch tree uh, by the wetland area and it flew from there south across the park and kept on going. And I thought, you know, that bird was migrating. It was at that time of the year, that's the time that they would have been there at the park. And I just remember thinking to myself, oh, this is great because to me, it meant that there was great, that the park held great promise. Um, not so much just as a place for people to enjoy, but also for the wildlife as well. And certainly over the 11 years or so that the park has been there now, that has proved to be the case. But we'll start with the wetland area itself. So here we've got, um, this is the, the rainfall curtain. If you've not been there at night, uh, the rainfall curtain is illuminated by some LED lights that change color. So, uh, so I just happened to snap this photograph of a great blue heron. I was riding my bike through the park, which is something I often do uh, after work. And I happened to see this bird and I thought, well, I'll go ahead and get this photograph because I knew it was something I don't see every day. And I often do carry my, my uh, camera with me just for this very reason, because I never know what I'm going to see. But in the daylight, this is what a great blue heron would look like. And in particular, this is a young bird. If this were an adult bird, um, the colors would be a little more mature and not quite so mottled and rusty looking. Uh, the adults a little more of an overall slate blue, uh, kind of a steel gray color. And it would have long plumes that come off the back of the head. But in this case, <clears throat> this was an immature great blue heron. And as you can see, he has made a meal out of uh, one of the goldfish, one of the many goldfish that are there at the park. Now, obviously the goldfish are not native. Um, somebody I'm sure just put them in there and they have done quite well ever since. So there are plenty of goldfish and there are some grass carp, uh, of course, that are there, but I suspect there are some other native fish uh, in there as well. Although, as I mentioned earlier, all of the water in the park is it's a completely man-made waterway. So any of the things there would have either been introduced by people or perhaps even by you know, crayfish or something like that, a turtle uh, making it on their own. And then another bird that I often see in the wetland area is the great egret. And primarily the, the great blue and the great egrets are year-round resident birds here in Alabama. 
And the great blue is a pretty regular bird at the park, but the great egrets, not so much. Um, I'm not quite sure why that is, uh, but they, they do occasionally make a visit. And just this past uh, late summer, we actually had two great egrets that spent about three weeks uh, there at the park. It was such a treat to see them because they stayed there for about three or four weeks. And it was really just a, a treat. And, you know, the word got out and everybody had a chance to get down there and, and see them there at the park. And, you know, typically if you wanted to see them, you would need to go to, oh, like maybe East Lake Park or um, one of the larger rivers, maybe over by Pell City to the Coosa River or Lake Purdy. But for whatever reason, um, they made Railroad Park their home uh, for about three or four weeks. And just as info, <clears throat> the red that you see here in the background is not the sunset, it's not the sun. This is actually the children of hospital, the children of Alabama uh, logo that is in the background here. So that's what that force of color is. But one of the other things that you'll see in the summertime, uh, if you go to the wetland area and all the other waterways in the park, is that you'll see the yellow flag iris and the blue flag iris uh, growing either along the shore or in the water. And this was several years ago now, but when I was there, just kind of standing there looking around, I happened to look down and see that there was a little bit of a, like a current was, being generated and I didn't quite know what it was so I looked a little bit more closely and I found this uh, red crayfish which I think these birds I mean these uh, crayfish were probably introduced um, uh, some of you may be familiar with the Schaefer uh, crayfish the eye center the Schaefer eye center they have their crayfish or crawfish boil um, every year as a fundraiser and one year they had it at the park and my guess is that when they got to the end and they had some crayfish <laughs> left over that were still alive, they just said, oh, let's go ahead and release them. But either way, uh, there, are, there is a healthy population of crayfish there at the park. And so this particular one was clinging, as you can see here, to a stalk of a yellow iris and it was using its little spinnerets, its little legs, and then these little spinnerets that are up here underneath uh, between the front uh, pinchers there. And it was creating this current. And as I sat there and watched it, it was obvious that what it was doing was creating a current to bring these little floating seeds of the uh, iris that had fallen into the water. And then it would go ahead and eat the seeds. And it was just the most <laughs> amazing little thing. And I thought, well, you know, it really does help to tell the story of the food pyramid there in the park. So you've got the yellow flag iris, you've got the crayfish that is eating the seeds of the yellow flag iris. And then if you go by the park in the summer, there is always a healthy um, population of yellow crown night heron uh, that are there at the park. Uh, primarily, they're here April through October, for the most part, the night heron. And this is an adult here, but one of their favorite food items are crayfish. And so here is one of the juveniles that ha has obviously found himself or herself a crayfish. And they will sit there and walk the little waterways, and they just peer rather intently into the water and lo and behold, they will snag a crayfish and down the hatch it goes. They just, they make sure they get it oriented straight and down the hatch. But that's always a nice little treat to see. And then here is another bird that I often see in the wetland area and that is the green heron. Um, this is another species just like the yellow crown night heron before it. Um, the green heron is another bird that is a migrant. So they move south in the winter time, but they come back to our area in April and they stay through about the end of October. Uh, and so this was an adult bird that I photographed last summer. And I believe that this is one of the adults <clears throat> of the pair 
that nested there last year. Um, three years ago was the first time I had ever seen a nest in the park. And that year they raised two young that you can see here. This is one of the benches uh, there at the park right next to the pavilion pool. And when the little green herons fledged, at it, that is they left their nest, uh, you could see them in various places in the park, primarily around the water. Uh, and they were just so fun to watch, I, it's such a treat. And, and they're such goofballs <laughs> when you look at them and they're kind of doofus looking, but they are just way too cute is all I can say. So this is two of them. This is obviously the older of the pair. Um, so apparently when green herons lay their eggs, um, they may lay them uh, asynchronously. They don't lay them all at once. They'll lay an egg a day for at least two days in this case. Um, but then they will start uh, incubating just as soon as they lay the egg. And so it, what happens is that you have generally one bird is a little bit older, a little bit further along in its development uh, than the other birds. And so that's what you see illustrated here. Um, but if the food is good, they will manage to, uh, to graze both of them successfully, which is what happened in this case. Uh, this past summer, there was just, there were two birds that, uh, that were hatched that I observed in the nest, but I only ever saw one of them as a fledgling. So I don't know if the other one uh, just fell victim to perhaps it, it was a prey item for another bird uh, once it left the nest, or perhaps it just never fully developed and it died uh, even before it had a chance to leave the nest. But this is one of the fledglings from last year. And as you can see, they look a little bit like the adult birds, just more overall brown. And they still have that little bit of fuzz, uh, just showing that they're the, the awkward teenage years uh, for green heron. And hopefully they'll be back. They've nested twice now. So hopefully they'll be back uh, in future years to continue nesting as well. And then this was probably one of the more surprising birds I ever saw <clears throat> in the park. And this was a, a wood duck, a, a male wood duck. And this was about maybe six or seven months after the park opened. Uh, I was down there one day and there was a male and two female wood ducks. And <clears throat> they were not banded. They didn't have any leg bands on them. So that led me to believe that they were wild ducks. And they were there for about three weeks. And, and so they're on the... the the eBird list for the park, but I haven't seen them there since. Uh, but you never know, that's the beauty of the park is that in addition to the resident birds, uh, other birds that just happen to be passing through are also uh, can be found at the park and it's just a hit or miss. So here's another hit or miss bird that I happened to see. This was, oh, probably three or four years ago. I was uh, headed to Redemptive Cycle, which is down on 2nd Avenue North. And I just happened to be riding past the, uh, the pavilion pool and I look over and there's this female hooded merganser. So thank God I had my camera and out came the camera. And I had this, uh, was able to get the shot of a female hooded merganser. And she was just there for one day and then she was gone. So again, it's maybe not a, a, the year round birds that need help, which obviously they do, but the park also provides suitable habitat for the transient birds as well. And then this is another bird that I see with some regularity actually there at the park. And this is the American coot. Um, and when I say regularity, it seems like they are there pretty much not so much like in, in the winter time. If you were to go to East Lake or maybe Patton Park or Avondale Park, you would probably see American coots now. And that is not the case for Railroad Park. But when these birds are migrating, especially in the spring of the year, I will often see some uh, <clears throat> there at the park. And I can remember, I guess it was last year, there was 18 of them. Uh, one day at the park and somebody alerted me to the fact that they were there. So I went down just to look at them. And then I went back at the end of the day. And just as the sun was setting, uh, you could tell the birds were kind of getting restless. 
And then when it came time, every last bird within the span of about a minute, every last bird just, they all took off, flew west and then banked and, and continued flying north. So again, the park is, in addition to the resident birds, it's also the transient birds as well. And then this is the bird that you will see with some regularity there at the park. And so this is a red winged blackbird. And you can see that there's just a little bit of a hint uh, in the in the wing and the epaulets. Uh, a little bit, you could call it kind of like a shoulder patch, so to speak. But when the um, cattails in particular, if there's a good stand of those uh, in the wetland or perhaps down in that 14th Street uh, in uh, pond, um, that's where the red-winged blackbirds seem to like the most are the cattails. But another bird that you'll see there <clears throat> are the common grackles. And they're not there so much now, uh, but in the spring and in the fall when they're coming through, it's not uncommon to see 10, 15, 20 of them at a time. And they just descend on the park and they're so loud and they're so raucous and they just carry on. I just, I really like seeing them a lot. Um, and they're colorful birds. If you were to see one up close, you could see that they are just uh, fabulous in their coloration. If you can see them in the, in the sunlight, uh, just a, a spectacular bird. Uh, but they don't breed at the park. They're just there to enjoy the, get a drink of water, perhaps feed a little bit, and then they're on their way. And if you go in the summertime, especially towards the end of the day, uh, you'll see uh, chimney swifts will be flying over the park and in particular over the pools of water. And so the chimney swifts, which are another favorite bird of mine, um, they will come down and they dip uh, into the water to get a drink or to take a bath. Um, but right at the end of the day, and it's pretty much every day, uh, right before the chimney swifts go to roost uh, in any of the nearby chimneys, they will come down to the park to get a drink of water. And another bird that you will see, uh, they are doing the exact same thing, although primarily throughout the day, are the rough wing swallows. And so here you can see it was in the spring or summer when I took these, the, this is the blue flag iris. And um, the swallows were conveniently were just swarming all over the, the pond. And I had to snap several photos <laughs> to get this one where they were uh, just posed as they are in this photograph. But in addition to a source of drinking water, um, the birds at the park also used a little shallow stream for bathing. And so here we have a, a male uh, eastern towhee or rufous-sided towhee, just a beautiful bird. And you'll hear them doing their little drink your tea call, but they, they nest in the park. And then let me, there we go, I'll shift it just a little bit. And hopefully you can see up at the top of the screen, there is an osprey, which is a bird of prey that specializes on uh, catching and eating fish. And so this was several years ago now, probably four years ago, I would think, uh, late summer, early fall, when the ospreys were migrating. And lo and behold, for about three weeks, this bird was a fairly regular sight, and this is the actual bird uh, the photograph there at the park. And it was taking advantage of the fact that those ponds are just loaded with carp and rather large goldfish. <laughs> and so uh, he just made himself at home there for about three weeks and kept on going. And, and he, as, as I understood it, he kind of alternated between Railroad Park and Avondale Park which as the osprey flies, you know, those are not too far from one another. Uh, and same thing for his patent park. So my feeling is that this bird was just making the rounds on a pretty regular basis. So, but some of the other food sources in the park would be plants. And so to me, that's where this park uh, really does shine. It's, it's an, a great example of if you plant the right plants, the birds will come. So I mentioned earlier the giant coneflower, or the Rudbeckia maxima is the species name for it. And this is what they look like. And so 
this part right down here is not the flower. The flowers are actually these little individual tiny things that you see up here. And each one of those, once it blooms, they bloom in sequence. And when they get um, pollinated, they form these little seeds. And so it looks uh, maybe not the most attractive thing once, once it goes to seed, but it is just an incredible source of food for the bird. And so in this case, we've got a house sparrow, which you know, may, may not be the most exotic bird. Uh, I, I was so thrilled to see that this particular bird was eating native seeds and not hanging out at the McDonald's parking lot begging French fries from, from passersby, which is how I typically envision a house sparrow. But there's a good population of them. They're not native, um, of course, but um, they are there at the park. And so you get to know them quite well. But again, he is he and she, there's uh, females there at the park as well. Uh, but they will uh, dine on the cone flower when the seeds are uh, ready. And then here is another sparrow that's definitely not a, a, a McDonald's French fry eating bird. This is a song sparrow. And if you look really carefully in its beak down here, you can see that it is scra uh, scavenging some of the seeds off of the ground. And this is below one of the yellow flag iris. And so this particular bird is just, is, if you look carefully, you can actually see all these twigs that have been tossed up into the air by the song sparrow as he is digging for these little seeds. So again, you've got this nice little cycle of the food chain going on here. Uh, so the song sparrows are resident birds at the park. They breed there. Um, they have a beautiful song. Uh, it's just it's a, it's a real treat to hear them. And what's interesting to me is that up until about maybe 10 or 12 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, Song sparrows were pretty unusual for the Birmingham area. We would have them in the winter time, but as a breeding bird, they were pretty scarce. But I'm happy to say that they have extended their range south. And so they now occur on a fairly regular basis uh, here in the breeding in the Birmingham area as a breeding species. And certainly Railroad Park is one of the strongholds where you can now go uh, and see them. Uh, they particularly like the, the little stream that runs along First Avenue South and any of the plazas there is a good spot. They, they really do <laughs> like those river birch trees and the wax myrtles and uh, they're just a, a treat to see for sure. And another type of sparrow that you find at the park <clears throat> although just in wintertime and primarily in that railroad right away, uh, assuming that they haven't cut the grasses, um, is the Savannah Sparrow. It's not one that breeds here, but it is a fairly common sparrow in Alabama in the wintertime. Uh, this particular bird was not photographed at the park. Uh, so this is one of those uh, where I had to borrow a photo from elsewhere. This is a bird I photographed down in uh, Marion, Alabama. And then here is a, a, another resident bird. This is that same male eastern tohi, and he too is foraging. Uh, you can see uh, it, that bright red eye. The female looks very similar to the male in that um, she has kind of a, a chocolatey brown color, and then the rufous side, and then the white belly. And then this is the male with the black uh, and just a beautiful song as well. They, they sing that little drink your tea, uh, just a beautiful bird. But when you see a bird like this or any of the sparrows with the nice cone shaped bill, um, these are, you can tell that these are seed eating type birds um, and that, that nice conical shaped bill is just ideal for, um, for cracking open seeds. And so another of the seed eating birds that you'll see there are the goldfinches. And they are primarily there uh, in the, not so much in the spring and summer, but more in fall and winter. 
uh, and that's the American goldfinch. This is the male, and you can see he's got he's dining on the uh, giant coneflower as well. And this is what the female looks like. She doesn't have the, the black cap that the male does. And this is their breeding colors here. This was a bird I photographed. It was in August, which is actually in the middle of their breeding season. Um, but in the winter time, they look a little bit more like the female does. They're not quite as colorful in the winter. And then uh, this truly is a, bird, a case of a bird that is named for uh, its food source. So these are wax myrtle trees. And if you were to go to the park now, you might still find some of these wax myrtle berries uh, on the tree. But if you go there in fall and start looking before the yellow rumped or the myrtle warblers arrive, you'll see plenty of the wax myrtle berries on the tree. However, once the fall arrives and the yellow rump show up, they descend on the park in huge numbers. And you'll find them in those wax myrtles just everywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they're, they're there to eat all of these berries. And I can honestly say, not this, you know, not this winter, but last winter, once they arrived, they did not leave the park until every last berry was gone. And there are healthy stands of the uh, wax myrtle trees uh, in the park, but oh my Lord, they ate every last berry and then, <laughs> then they were gone. And so they are quite, you, you can't miss them when they're there. They're very active birds. They're constantly flitting about and they have this uh, little smacking noise uh, that they make at the, very obvious that when you hear it, but this is what they look like. So it's called the yellow rump for a reason. Um, but prior to their being renamed the yellow rump, they used to call them myrtle warblers. And so now they're called yellow rump war warblers, but we use the myrtle warbler to d distinguish it from the Audubon's version of the yellow rump warbler. And the Audubon's is a Western species of yellow rump, but it's technically considered the same species. Uh, but this is what they look like. And then another bird that you'll see uh, dining on the trees and the uh, plants at the park are the house finches. And so here we have a male house finch that is eating the seeds of a green ash. A little bit later in the season, you'll find um, cedar waxlings. So the cedar waxlings are here now, and they too are enjoying the, the bounty of the park. And if you look really carefully, you may eventually find a, uh, a cedar waxling that doesn't have the typical yellow tip on the tail, but you might see one that has an orange tip. And the reason they have an orange tip is because those are birds that have been primarily feeding on a, it's a species of honeysuckle that is non-native that gives them uh, that particular orange coloration. And then another tree that you'll see at the park, another plant of interest are the tulip poplar trees. And you may know that they uh, bloom primarily in April in the spring of the year. And if you look very carefully at this tulip poplar bloom, you'll see that it has a hole in the side. So chances are what caused that hole was back when this, before it bloomed out and it was just a tight little bud, either an orchard oriole or a Baltimore oriole, both of which have been reported from the park. Um, when they come through on their spring migration, which is in April, of course, um, it, it, incidentally, you know, it's, you know, when you think of birds and flowers that are, you know, the migrants that are coming through in the spring, and it just so happens that the flowers are blooming in the spring, well, the reason that happens is because the flowers need to be pollinated and hey, why not bloom your flowers when your pollinators are passing through? And so the orchard orioles have come to realize that in the base of the bud of the tulip poplar bloom is the, the nectary that produces the nectar, uh, very sweet uh, fluid. And so they will come by and they will, even before the plant opens, before the bloom opens, they will pierce the flower 
the bud to get to the nectar that is in the nectar. And so in this particular case though, he was actually, this is the first spring male, he was actually getting a sip of water out of one of the bracts. And another bird that you will see there in the tulip poppers quite often are the summer tanagers. This is the bright red male. The female is a little bit of a chartreuse green color. And then certainly the rose-breasted grosbeaks are, will pay a visit when they come through in the latter part of April as well. Uh, just a spectacular bird. This is the male uh, here. And it's just a beautiful song if you can hear one. And then another uh, plant uh, of great uh, interest to the birds there at the park is the American beautyberry. It's just a beautiful uh, plant. It blooms uh, in this, oh, say like in the early, not so much early spring, but later spring and in the uh, early summer. And then by the time fall rolls around late summer and into fall, you will see the berries, these bright uh, purple berries clustered around the leaves like this. And I can assure you, if you go there now, every little stand of beauty berry, there's, there's at each of the plazas, the 14th Street, 15th, 16th, 17th, all of those plazas uh, have got some beauty berry planted by them. And there is at least one mockingbird that is defending his little stash of beauty berry. So the mockingbirds are there feasting on those and they will defend them quite uh, heartily against any and all comers. Another uh, critter that likes to feed on the beauty berries are the little mice in the park. There's a nice little healthy rodent population. And so here I just happen to be watching one day and look down and I see this movement, it catches my eye and lo and behold, there's a little mouse feeding on the beauty berry. And then as it so happened, he was also harvesting some of the seed heads from the cone flowers. And so he would walk out and he would kind of clamber out to the end, snip it off, and then he would essentially drop to the ground with the seed head in his, in his uh, grip. And then he would take it down to his little burrow that was at the base of the plant. And it, I had to laugh at one point because he had, he had made the mistake of going out the stalk. Uh, and then he turned around and cut, bit through it. And then so then he didn't have the chance. He just fell to the ground. He didn't have a chance of doing a little controlled fall. But he essentially cut the stalk out from, from under him. So maybe not the smartest mouse. But he was doing what he needed to do to help survive the winter when the food was scarce. But as you might imagine, just because there are rodents in the park, there are also birds that like to feed on the rodents. And so the red-tailed hawk is a pretty common sight uh, there at Railroad Park. And also the, all the plants uh, attract insects. Here we've got a leaf-footed bug on the American beauty berry. And certainly there are some years more so than others, there's a good population of dragonflies that you'll see. But with all the insects that are there at the park, you'll also find the insect eaters like this Eastern Phoebe, which is a year round bird for us. Um, and it just so happened just last summer, almost if not last January, I should say, almost a year to the day, uh, I was down at the park and I happened to look up and saw this uh, Eastern Phoebe flying up from the water. It had smacked into the water and was flying up to a perch. And I thought, did that bird just catch a minnow? because it's an insect eater. And I thought, well, that's really odd. So I watched it a little bit and lo and behold, uh, it, the, what I thought was exclusively an insect eater turns out to be one that will also uh, advantageously feed on uh, minnows if they, can, if they can catch one. So I actually watched this bird catch three minnows in total. And I later went home and, and did a little research and found out that they, they do indeed have been documented catching minnows uh, at other places, especially in the West, there's a species called the black phoebe that has been documented um, catching minnows, uh, not so much the Eastern phoebe. Uh, so I, I, I went ahead and wrote that up for uh, inclusion uh, in the Alabama BirdLife magazine that will be coming out soon. 
But here is another Eastern, uh, this is an Eastern wood peewee, which is another type of flycatcher. Um, so they have these wide bills. And if you look carefully, you can see on these birds that they have these little bristles around their uh, beak, which help them to sense when the insects are there because they'll, they'll perch in the open like this and then they will fly out and catch an insect and those little rictal bristles, they call them, uh, help the birds to uh, know when to snap their bill closed. And here's another uh, type of a flycatcher. This is an Eastern Kingbird. Uh, this particular photograph was not made at the park, but I have seen them there a couple times now. Red-eyed vireos are another insect eating bird, but these are birds that tend to glean insects from the canopy rather than the fly catching technique of flying out and catching one and coming back. These are birds that like to stalk through the canopy, so to speak. Here we have a black and white warbler, beautiful little bird that is on a crepe myrtle trunk. Um, here we have a bay-breasted warbler in the fall uh, that is in a, uh, I think that's a, not the river, I guess that is a river birch, uh, now that I think about it. But the river birch is just a really buggy kind of tree. And so a lot of the uh, warblers and the other neotropical migrants like to hang out in those trees because of all the insects. Here we have another plant that really isn't so much a plant that feeds birds directly, but is one that attracts the insects that the birds feed on. So here we have a northern water thrush, which is a type of warbler uh, photographed in the park last fall. And lo and behold, as I was sitting there watching this bird, I noticed that it was just kind of jumping up and down uh, and I couldn't quite tell what it was doing. And so when I got home and looked at my photograph, I could see that what it was actually doing was catching all these little insects that were buzzing around the blossoms of the Virginia sweet spire. So even though I wouldn't necessarily think of, you know, warblers and sweet spires going together, what they're, what they have in common is that they're both there for the insects, for the insects are what attract them there, I should say. But other birds that you can see in spring and fall migration, I'll just show a, a quick uh, couple of them here spring and fall migrants that come through but don't breed in the park. Again, these are just transients that are taking advantage of the suitable habitat. Here we've got a prairie warbler that has caught a spider that just a few seconds before I made the photograph, that spider was safely ensconced up under this dead leaf in the river birch. Um, another rather colorful warbler that you'll see uh, there in the park is the male American red star in migration. Um, here is perhaps maybe the rarest bird I've seen at the park, and this is a clay-colored sparrow. And I, I can remember talking to my sister, Treese, on the phone, uh, and I said, Treese, I got to hang up. There's an unusual looking bird I need to check out. So I quickly snapped a few photographs, and I was pretty sure that it was a clay-colored sparrow, just based on this gray on the mate. A uh, pretty distinctive bird. And I'd only seen them a handful of times, always down at the coast. And so I later found out that this was the eighth sighting of a clay-colored sparrow in the mountain region, so in our area of Birmingham. And it was just there for the morning. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody else even saw it, but again, there it was. It was there one day and it's gone the next. Uh, other uh, birds that you'll see at the park is migrants, common yellowthroat. Here is a female and or immature not quite sure it was in fall migration and it's hard to tell them apart at that age. Uh, here we have a young magnolia warbler, a ruby crown kinglet, which is a, a winter bird. And speaking of winter birds, we also have white-throated sparrows uh, there at the park. Uh, in this case, they too are feeding on the seeds of the green ash. And then some of the uh, breeding birds at the park, uh, I mentioned earlier the song sparrow. You can see one here. I just happened to catch them in full-throated song. Uh, morning doves certainly uh, nest at the park. I just love them. They're plain looking birds, but if you look at them up close, that powder blue eye ring is just the most incredible color. Uh, and it's just, it's a beautiful bird. It's, it's the only species that I know of in Alabama that has been documented nesting 
every, every month of the year. Typically they're like the other birds and, <clears throat> and nest in the spring and in the summertime. But in this case, uh, this particular bird, this was photographed just this past summer. Uh, here we have a young brown thrasher uh, photographed there, actually right next to the pavilion uh, in one of the magnolia trees there. Uh, Northern mockingbirds, I showed you a photograph of them earlier. Uh, here they are. This is the bird that is defending his stash of possum haw berries. Uh, there's a couple of pairs of cardinals uh, that nest there at the park, and you'll see them pretty much any time you go down there. And certainly the robins, uh, there's always a good population of them at the park, uh, even as nesting birds. And here it is just a cute little bird. I happened to see him <laughs> walking on the main path along First Avenue South the side of the park. And this bird was just about when I say he was eight inches off the path, he was eight inches off the path. He was just right there, but just so cute, cute as a dickon. So that's the last of the photographs I have. And I, as I mentioned, there are now 99 species of birds that have been documented at the park. And so I don't know what the hundredth one will be, uh, but I hope we get it soon is all I can say. I'm looking forward to that milestone. So I will stop the screen share and I will go back to looking at the chat and see if anybody had any questions. So I do see one from James up here. It says, do you have a feel for how the number of species in railroad park compares to other Birmingham urban parks? That's an excellent question. So my feeling is that the other parks, um, it, it depends on the variety of the habitat. So if you were to go to Avondale Park, uh, because Avondale, it has a water source just like Railroad Park does, and they're very similar, but the, there's much more mature trees at Avondale Park. If you were to go to, say, East Lake Park or Patton Park, which is the park that's there, um, there at the Tallapoosa Street exit off of I-2059, uh, Patton Park doesn't have nearly, it has a good stand of hackberry trees, and hackberries are great for attracting uh, birds that will either eat the berries or uh, the insects. Uh, hackberry is another buggy uh, type of tree, but generally um, the, what really makes the difference is having a source of water and a good variety of plants. And so, if, and if I can use Railroad Park as an example, when I first started keeping my eBird list at the park, I, I remember when, when I hit like 35 or 36 species, I remember thinking to myself, oh, I hope that someday we're able to reach 40 because I thought that would be a great goal. And then lo and behold, you know, here we are on the brink of 100. And I think the reason that is, is that as the trees in the park are maturing and as the plant life is maturing, um, it's attracting more and more birds because of those plants. And so I, I honestly think, you know, at some point it wouldn't surprise me if we we're able to get to 120 or 125 different species there at the park. And, and what's gonna be the key is birds that are coming through in migration. If you were to go there now, you know, you would see the mockingbirds, the cardinals, uh, the song sparrows, the house sparrows, and, and maybe not a whole lot else. Uh, my friend, uh, Gary, that spotted the hermit thrush there yesterday, that was the 99 species. So um, they are, it's gonna be birds that are just there on a temporary basis. Another unusual bird that I've seen at the park twice now in the 11 years I've been going by there is Eastern Meadowlark. And, you know, that even though there's open grassy areas, it's really not Meadowlark habitat with the exception of um, where the, like where the switchgrass is growing on the hillside that borders the north part of the park. And as, as you might imagine, both of the times that I have seen the Meadowlark there, uh, they, they quickly went into the first opportunity they got, so to speak, they went into that habitat just because it provides the cover. 
So the source of water in the in the plant life is that mature. That's what's going to make the difference uh, there at the park. Um, uh, goldfinch. Earlier, uh, earlier in your presentation, you showed us a tanager. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it didn't say scarlet tanager. Are, 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 there's a difference, right? In, in what uh, yeah. Yeah. So the one that was in the photograph was a summer tanager. And so that is the bird that we have here in Alabama as a breeding species, uh, pretty much April through October. And so, but the scarlet tanager, which looks very similar to that in terms of the males are this bright red color. But in the scarlet tanager, they have a jet black wing. It is just, it's quite the contrast. It's an all red bird on the body, but it's got a jet black wing. And they, they sound a little bit alike, um, but you can usually, if you listen carefully, you can usually pick them apart. They sound a little bit like a robin actually. Um, but we get both species here in the Birmingham area. If you wanted to go, a good place to look for the tanagers would be like, um, well, certainly railroad park in migration, especially in those tulip poplar trees. Uh, but then also as a breeding bird, uh, Oak Mountain State Park and Ruffner Mountain would be really good areas to look for them. And, and they would even occur in your yard if they are, if it's a suitably uh, forested tree, they really are birds that like to be in the canopy. And certainly when the tulip poplar trees are blooming in the spring, I mean, th those trees are just magnets for birds with those blooms. Uh, it's just, it's an amazing sight for sure. But we yeah, do I've get got, both of them here, scarlet. I've got, uh, I've got some uh, scarlet tanagers come through up here on Shades Mountain occasionally. I've, we've got a lot of tulips up here on the mountain too. There you go. Yeah, so just keep an eye out for them uh, starting about the April 15th or so, something like that, April 10th, somewhere in that range. And just keep looking, is all I can say. <laughs> uh, I do see a, a question from Ann Price in the chat. She says, does the goldfinch molt before winter to a duller coat or do the feathers fade in color? So they actually do molt. They molt. Um, so the, the black that you see on the male, um, they molt those feathers. And then in the spring, they will molt back those, the, the black that you see. Um, but some birds will molt uh, some of their feathers in the, in the spring prior to the breeding season. And then some of them are in the fall. Um, and generally it's the bird, it's the feathers that add color, so to speak, <laughs> are the ones that are being molted. Uh, so, it, but in the, it, it depends on the species, but some of them will molt all of their feathers. They like, not all at once, but slowly over time, they will molt all of their feathers in the spring or in the fall. And it's the same thing with, you know, waterfowl, it, all birds are constantly replacing their feathers, uh, spring and fall. It's just a matter of whether they're replacing all of them at once or in the case of the goldfinches, it's just some of them are being molted uh, prior to winter. So are, there, are there any other questions? Well, Greg, you mentioned the molting. Uh, I'm a little bit familiar with penguins molting. It takes a whole lot of energy. Uh, yes, for yes. them to molt. Is this true or is it noticeable in the songbirds and other birds up in this area that molting really requires a lot of energy? It, oh, yes, right. As you, I mean, it's they're essentially re replacing in an, a, a body part, an entire feather. So, yeah, it's a very labor intensive and energy, not so much labor intensive, but energy intensive process for them to molt those feathers. Um, and some birds, if you think of like, uh, like uh, sea, I won't say seagulls, but just gulls that you'll see at the coast, primarily when you think of a gull, you're thinking of a, a bird that's generally white that has black uh, either on its head or on its wingtips or uh, maybe at the tip of the tail. Uh, and so if you think about it, um, Black is just, it's a pigment that the birds are actually synthesizing and depositing in their feathers. 
And so it takes energy to synthesize that pigment as well. So in the case of the gulls, it, it benefits them since they are primarily uh, out in the sunshine all of the time. If they were a solid black bird, uh, it, it might lend itself to overheating, so to speak. Uh, but in the case of a lot of our gulls, they only will deposit the, the black pigment where it's needed. And so, uh, which is in the case of the gulls in the wingtips and at the tip of the tail, because those are the areas that sustain the most wear and tear on, on the feathers, it's the tips of the feathers. And so it, since it is such an energy intensive process, they just deposit those uh, you know, chemicals, if you want to call it that, those pigments where they're needed and why not, you know, why to put them all over the place if you really just need them uh, there. And so that, then you, if you think of it, the, the black adds a, uh, a bit of a structural rigidity to the feather. And so I always, maybe this is not the appropriate crowd here, what I often is, as I'm getting grayer myself, I think, you know, my hair is getting a little more brittle and it's because I'm losing the, you know, the pigmented part of my hair follicles to the gray part and the gray is a little more fragile, so to speak. And so, so it's, you know, it's, it's true of the birds as well. They're depositing that pigment where it's needed the most because it adds a, the rigidity to the feather where it's needed most. So any other questions? Yeah, Greg, this is Steve Ross. And I have a yeah. technical question. Sure. So what lens are you using? Oh, OK. So my camera equipment that I use for most all of those photographs is I'm using a Nikon uh, D500 uh, um, SLR, DSLR camera. Right. And the lens that I'm using is also a Nikon 200 to 500 uh, millimeter lens so it's, it's got a pretty good reach on it and right because, what, what is the uh what is the f range from what to what uh, so it's it starts at like 5.6 and i can't okay. remember if it goes to 22 I, I think it might be 5.6 to 22 or maybe 28 so when you're at 500 you're really fairly limited in your light uh yes yes the most definitely okay. Nice. But, you know, the nice thing about the D500 is that it has a pretty good uh, capacity, the ISO capacity, the ISO range on it. And so typically, my typical setting on a, on a typical day, if it's a sunny day, would be an ISO of 1000. And then almost all of my photographs, I'm using my flash uh, on the camera. It's not, it, the camera doesn't have a built-in flash but I have an external flash. And so that adds a little bit of a pop, uh, a little bit of a highlight to the eyes if I'm close enough. One, uh, of the, one of the things I noted, I took some photographs of some birds in nests and I used the flash and I discovered that the birds don't seem to get startled. It, yeah, by. yeah. And, and so I know in some place, it, it, it seems to me that in places where thunder and lightning is, you know, a common occurrence in the lives of these birds. Uh, you know, a flash of light isn't anything that surprises them, especially if it's a bright, sunny day. And you might think, well, you know, if it's a bright, sunny day, why are you using a flash in the first place? And the reason I do that is to help remove some of the shadows, um, to help compensate for deep shadow. And it just tends to make it a more overall. And then if you've got, let me see if I can go back to, uh, now, let's see here. I may have to try to share my screen so I can show you an example of one. Go back to, let's see. Yeah, so here is the Magnolia Warbler. So as you can see, the bird is pretty well illuminated. And then right here in the center of the eye is that little white spot. And so that is, you know, that's the influence of the flash uh, doing that. So I'll stop the screen share again. But yeah, so I use a flash and I, I'm surprised more people don't use flashes uh, to tell you the truth, but um, it's one that I typically use. The other lens that I use for my landscape uh, pictures is a 28 to 72, I think, or it might be an 80. 
Uh, but it's another Nikon lens. Okay, thanks. Oh, sure. Uh, we have another question from Anne. Says, if birds age, are they less able to make strong pigments? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I would even know that. Uh, I think that they're able to continue doing that. I mean, I when I think of birds, uh, I, I would say that that's probably true. That, that I mean, that it's not true that they are able to continue synthesizing the pigments that they need. And I think maybe the reason that that might be is just that as birds get older, if they become feeble or weak, uh, well, then they become quickly part of the food chain. Um, you know, they're somebody else's prey item. Uh, but th that being said, uh, there are situations where you can, you'll see a bird that clearly is having problems synthesizing pigments. And what comes to mind is about maybe four years ago, there was a herring gull that showed up at Avondale Park that was just in horrible, horrible shape. It, it stayed there for like, I don't know, four or five weeks. And I think it, the reason it was there was because its wings, its feathers were in such sad shape. They were so worn. And it was just the feather shafts were completely worn down to where it was practically just, in some cases, all you could see was just the barb and not even so much the feather. So, you know, that was a bird that truly had to sit tight until it could generate some new feathers. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes out at the wildlife center at, at at Oak Mountain State Park, uh, they will get birds there uh, that are otherwise healthy, but if they don't have the necessary feathers that have grown in, the birds aren't able to fly as well. So it's not uncommon for them to have a bird that is perfectly healthy, eating well, you know, all the check mark, except for the fact that it doesn't have, it has to wait for new feathers to grow in. Now, in some species of raptors, in particular, the larger birds, it is possible that you can imp a feather where you just collect a feather from a, a donor wing, uh, a bird that was previously deceased, and they will save the wing or save the feathers. And they have what they call a feather bank, and they'll just pull the feather out of one bird, out of one, out of the wing of the deceased bird. And they will just, if they've got, it's always the exact same feather in the exact same location on the wing because they're, they're very specific in the number of feathers they have in their secondaries and in their primary feathers. Um, but so what they'll do is they'll clip it down to the base of the uh, previous feather that had been there, the defective feather, and then they will just glue in the, the donor feather. And then that way they're able to release the bird ahead of schedule. And then when the bird naturally molts the feather that should have been there, well, then the donor feather comes out and, and the new feather grows in. So that's, that's uh, one way to take advantage of the fact that birds are pretty regular with their uh, molt patterns. So one of the other aspects of molting seems to be the baby feathers have to be molted out and new adult feathers grown in before they can really fledge and, and fly, or maybe as they're in that period. Is that right? Yes, that, that's correct. And if you think of that photograph of the baby robin and even the baby uh, green heron, you know, they had those little bits of down feathers were still there. So the down feathers are their first feathers and those quickly grow out and then you'll get these little pin feathers, the juvenile feathers growing in. And then typically birds that are born or hatched, I shouldn't say born, that are hatched in the spring of the year, they will undergo their first molt in the fall of that, of that same year. And so if you look at a lot of field guides, you'll note that uh, if there's a situation where the bird looks different between the juvenile or not the juvenile, but the immature stage and the adult stage, they will illustrate that, you know, the immature bird and they'll illustrate the adult bird, but they don't necessarily, a lot of times they will not illustrate the juvenile uh, 
plumage because they're in that plumage for just a relatively short, it's a couple months. So if you've got a bird, even the smaller birds might live six or seven years, but they're in that juvenile stage for just a couple months between when they, after they have molted in their juvenile feathers after the, uh, the down feather. And then in the fall, they will molt their, either their flight feathers or their body feathers or contour feathers. Um, and so because it's such a short time span in the life of the bird, and because the space is limited <laughs> in these field guides, they will just illustrate the, the immature plumage that the bird will then have until it reaches the point where it becomes an adult. Uh, and in the case of like the gulls and bald eagles, for instance, you know, they'll illustrate uh, the subsequent years. Um, until they get to be the adult, but for the most part, say like those uh, summer tanagers, for instance, or even the 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 oriole, that the orchard oriole, uh, their first spring back, the males look like the one that you saw there in in the photograph. So that was that particular bird was a bird that had been hatched the previous spring, and it was now a year old, coming back for its first nesting season. The next year, this year, when it comes back, it will actually not be green and black or green and dark on the wing. It will actually be a, uh, a brick red color. So that's what they call a bird that's like a two year, it takes them two years uh, to get their adult plumage. And in the case of some of the gulls, uh, they'll say, well, it's a two year gull or a three year gull or a four year gull. And what that refers to is the number of years it takes for them to achieve their full adult plumage. So I don't want to divert us to penguins, but you're talking about molting and they have a very interesting uh, aspect to molting. They have to do it very quickly because their season uh, is, is only a few months before they then have to go to the water for the rest of the year. And so the, the chicks, uh, they molt, they have to molt before they can go to the water because their baby feathers are not waterproof, so they would drown. So they're at the end of their season, they're having to molt all their feathers at one time, pretty much, or yeah. over a short period of time, and grow new adult feathers, which is very energy um, dependent. And so the only energy they get is the feedings from the adults that are going off to feed and bring food back to them because there's no food on land. Mm. So they molt very quickly and their entire bodies basically one time has to molt. And then the adults also at the end of the season, the adults are molting because they're putting on new feathers for having to spend the rest of the year, bulk of the year in the water and on their own without going to land. So it's very interesting at the end of the season, you're seeing the babies growing their, their adult feathers at the same time. Often you're seeing, at the, uh, even after that, you're seeing the adults molting to get rid of those old feathers and get new good ones for the rest of the year. So it's just interesting difference in molting between those and the birds we see around here. Yeah. Another bird that would employ a similar strategy as far as molting a lot of feathers at once are waterfowl. Um, because if you think of uh, males and females, they're sexually dimorphic. The males tend to be a little more colorful than the female. And the males will molt their feathers uh, after the breeding season. And, and they essentially, as you said, they will molt a, a lot of their feathers uh, all at once uh, before they grow in the new feathers and so for a span of about oh maybe two or three weeks the males and the females are flightless they're they're unable to fly uh, while they grow in the new feathers greg thank you very much oh you're most welcome and we'll be back to you to ask for a walk through the park in the spring i i would love to do that i would really really welcome that opportunity we're going to plan it. Okay. Before, well, before we sign off, okay. Yeah. Before right. we sign off, I would just like to uh, once again uh, thank uh, Greg for being such a good friend to me all the years uh, uh, that I moved here. Uh, and also, 
give him credit for being the one that referred me to New Horizons. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you, Greg. <laughs> oh, you bet, you bet. Ryan, I'm coming to you live from, from the dental school here in the lab. I just have my Audubon screen up on the, on the picture. Right. I'm here your, at the lab up on the- Your evening. experiments are working, right? It, yeah, right. Okay, good. All righty, well, thank you, everybody. It's been a real treat for me to be here today with you. So enjoy Thanks, the rest Greg. of your day and hopefully we'll get together really soon to get out to the park. I'm, I'm looking we forward will. to that. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Greg. Sure enough, Ron. We'll see Another you later. Another home run. All righty. Thank you much.